with today. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to please stand up from their seats. Let's uh, begin uh, today's word with a prayer. We just thank you and praise you, Lord, for um, your presence in our midst. We thank you, O oh God, because you are good, you are always good, you are faithful, and you are kind. This morning, as we worship you through the study of the word, we um, lay our concerns at your footstool, O oh God. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us. We pray that you will move in our midst in a very special way. And Lord, our prayer today is that you will be glorified. You will be magnified. The name of Jesus will be exalted. This is our prayer through his name. Amen. And amen. You may now take your seats. Today we begin our series, uh, this four-part series which we have called Already But Not Yet, Living in the Land Between. There was an article in the New York Times that uh, told of executives in an airport in Houston uh, where they were receiving quite a lot of passenger complaints about the length of time that they had to wait for the baggage to arrive. I think uh, many of you have experienced this when uh, you go to an air, um, you take a flight and then you arrive at your destination and then uh, the plane lands and then you go to the baggage claim area and it takes a while for your luggage to arrive, right? And for this particular airport in Houston, um, there were a lot of complaints. People were saying, you know, it takes so long for our luggage to arrive. And so the executives of this uh, airport uh, responded. And uh, they hired or added a lot more uh, baggage handlers in which that uh, they were able to successfully cut the time down to eight minutes. So this was, in fact, uh, better than the standards. No? So um, the problem was the, the, the complaints persisted. People were still complaining that their luggages arrived late. And so what they did is that they did an on-site uh, analysis and they found out that um, the passengers, it would only take the passengers one minute to walk from the arrival gate to the baggage claim area. And so what happens is that the airport took a different approach to the problem. Instead of reducing the wait time of the people uh, who are waiting for the luggage, what they did is they moved the arrival gate farther away. So that the people had to walk six times longer uh, to arrive at the baggage claim area where they will get their baggage. And you know what happened? Complaints dropped down to zero. And they discovered one important lesson. And it's that it's what you do while you're waiting that makes the difference. It's what you do while you're waiting that makes the difference. It doesn't matter, actually, whether you're waiting for your luggage or you're uh, in a fast food uh, um, restaurant um, about to order your food or you're in the elevator waiting for the elevator to come down. What you do while you're waiting determines whether the experience becomes um, positive or becomes dreadful for you. Now, as Christians, we are living in between the birth of Jesus Christ and his second coming. We are in a state of waiting, right? Now, the Bible, um, well, Bible teachers call it inaugurated eschatology, to be a little technical about it, or simply already, but not yet. What that means is this. In Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, the author of uh, Hebrews tells us that in the last days, um, God has spoken to us through His Son. And we read that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. What that means is that He's telling the Hebrew people and us today that 
In the Old Testament, when the prophets were telling us that God will finally redeem and save His people in a definite way, He's telling us that that salvation, that redemption has already come to pass through the Son, through Jesus Christ. Christ in His death and in His resurrection has brought salvation. It's what we call inaugurated, but it's not yet complete. Okay? Because we're still waiting for the second coming. Is the microphone on? Um, can I have this? Hello, test. Test, mic test. Hello. Okay, sorry about that. So let me just say that again. Um, uh, when cr Christ died and he resurrected, um, he has given us salvation. It's called inaugurated because it has already, he already started the ball rolling. But the fact is this, it's not yet complete. We are still living in this earth. We are still waiting for the second coming, right? And so uh, that's our state today. It's already, we're already saved, but not yet. We are still waiting for the culmination and the fulfillment of the promise of God. Now, you find that language all over the New Testament. There's a, an aspect of being already, and there's also the aspect of being not yet. For example, Jesus tells us that we have eternal life. If you believe in Him, whoever believes in Him has crossed over from death to life. It's in the past tense. So Jesus is saying, you are already saved you already have eternal life but also when you read the scriptures you will also see that jesus not only talks about eternal life as now he also, he's all he also talks about it as something that happens in the future because you know today we still live in this human form of life that that we fail that we ha we have pain we experience all of that and that eternal life will finally be fulfilled when we have our glorified bodies, when we are with the Lord, finally, when He comes, right? And so both are true. It's already, but not yet, okay? Inaugurated, but not consummated. The final fulfillment actually comes when Jesus finally comes back. And so in this particular series, I'd like for us to consider what do we do as we live in the already, but not yet, okay? As I've mentioned earlier, uh, it's what we do as we wait that makes the difference, right? So what do we do as we wait in hope for the second coming of Jesus Christ? So we're going to do this series. We're going to divide it into four uh, general topics, which I believe is very important for us to think about. And this morning... We're going to consider the question, what do you do when you're in a place where you don't want to be? Okay, what do you do when you're in a place where you don't want to be? Now, for some of us, that means, you know, that, that happens with a sudden conversation that drops off like a bomb. I'm pregnant. Or your position has been eliminated. Or dad... I'm in the prison or in the police station. Or your mom and I are, are separating. I don't love you anymore. Or, I'm having second thoughts about the wedding. We think your mom just had a stroke. How fast can you come to the hospital? You know, some, some of these things come to us as a shock. But, but for others, you know, other experiences come in a slow and gradual way. Uh, for years, your, your business has been struggling. You have tried to infuse additional money into it. But, you know, the last couple of years, you've been holding on by a thread. Or perhaps your marriage is suffering a, a slow but constant erosion until the time comes when somebody just has to leave. Or perhaps, you know, the, the heart of your teenage son or daughter is, is gradually and slowly drifting away from you and from God. Your spouse experiences gradual memory loss that you finally realize that you're losing the memories that, that both of you have shared and there's nothing you can do about it. And so whether you enter into this space, 
from uh, based on a single conversation that suddenly just blows up on your face or, or it comes to you gradually over time the, the 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 space is very much the same and we wonder how do we navigate in that space that we don't want to be because as we said as we've said earlier it's what we do while we are waiting while we are in that space that makes the difference. Now, the, the thing is this. All of us have either been there, or we are there, or we will be in that space that we do not want to be. Now, I don't think, not, I don't think any of us will escape that reality because we live in, in a world um, of sin. We, we still sin. This is, uh, we are, um, we fail. People fail us. And the fact is something will go wrong, right? Because if you find your, yourself in that space today, I just want you to know that there's a place in the map that you can find yourself. Let me show you this map here. Um, and let me just explain. That's where you are, that circle, that red circle that you find there. Um, actually, that stretch of land is called the Sinai Desert. Uh, on a satellite map, that's about brown or yellow because it's a desert, okay? Now, look over to the left, you will see Egypt, right? Um, notice that it's green. Um, it's green because the Nile River Valley, um, you know, feeds on the place. And also, you will look at the top right portion uh, it's also green. That's Canaan. That's the land of promise. In the Old Testament, it's called the land flowing with milk and honey. Now, there's an era, there's a period in the history of Israelites which is called the wilderness wanderings. And, and we know that they have been in the wilderness for 40 years, okay? Now, if you remember, the story is like this. God took the Israelites out from slavery in Egypt, right? And he, he, Moses, he used Moses to do that, and he tells the Israelites that I'm going to bring you out from slavery, from this land of slavery, to a promised land, which I, I promised to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, right? That's what happened in the story. We, we know the story, Ten Commandments, or, you know, for some of you, Prince of Egypt. <laughs> and and that's, what, that's the story. Right? God tells his people, I'm going to bring you out from Egypt into the promised land. So it's, they're going from green space to green space, right? But here's the thing. Nothing was said about the time in the middle. The land between. Okay? It's the desert. And all of us, we find ourselves in that land between. If you think about it as well, as Christians... If you have given your life to Jesus Christ and you have surrendered your life to Him, you are a believer, you have eternal life. Already you are saved. And we are waiting to go to our promised land, in a sense, eternity with Christ, with God forever. But God has put us today in the land between, right? We live in this world that uh, in, in this sinful world, we live in a world of, of pain, of failures, of sin. So in a sense, we are all in the land between, right? Now, we go back to this story. Here's what happened to the Israelites. We, we let, we're, I'm going to um, show to you a couple of verses from Numbers chapter 11. Okay, this is part of the Exodus story. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Numbers 11. Um, as the Israelites move from the land of slavery, from Egypt, and to the land of promise, they are now in the wilderness, and they have been in the wilderness in this part of the story, something like about two years. Okay, so imagine two years in the wilderness. How did they survive? God provided them manna, right? Do you remember that? God provided them manna. Literally, the word manna means, what is it? And because it just appeared one day from the ground, and they, would, they saw this, and they said, what is it? So it's called manna. Numbers 11, chapter 7 to 9, that's, this is how it is described. 
It says, The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it in a hand mill or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into cakes, and it tasted like something made with olive oil. When the Jew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. And so the people would collect this, what is it, this manna, and they ate this day after day after day. Now question, for those of you who like to cook, how many ways can you prepare manna? How many? <laughs> I don't know, you can boil it. You can broil it, you can bake it, can you saute it, whatever it is. The, at the end of the day, it's still the same stuff, right? It's still manna. So they have been in the desert for two years, and they've been eating manna every day, and they're sick of it. Okay? Now, when I say they're sick of this stuff, let me show you Numbers 11 verses uh, Numbers 11, verses 4 to 6. And uh, as we read these verses, you know, these verses will, will be more realistic if you read it with a whiny voice. Okay? The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna, this what is it. We're sick of this stuff. We're tired of this manna again. Remember that story about the Chinese white Chinese has, has small eyes? Because every morning when they wake up, or when we Chinese wake up, we do this. Luga on side. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> you know, we read a passage like that and we think, you know, how childish. We point out that these guys are, are so ungrateful. They're so immature. They're so childish. And it's very easy for us to place ourselves above them and we think and think that, you know, we are more superior than them. But it might actually be better if we put ourselves among the characters and, and think, you know what? Maybe given the set of circumstances, I might have said the same thing. Let me give you an illustration. How many of you like uh, to eat uh, instant noodles? Okay, no, no shame in that. Okay. Um, you know, instant noodles... It's cheap. You can buy it for seven, eight bucks, right? And it's it's nice to eat if um, for for cold days sometimes, right? It's not bad, only if you don't eat them every day, right? There was this article from Reader's Digest about. Actually, I read several articles. There's one in Huffington Post of a guy who decided to eat only ramen noodles for 30 days, and and there's this guy. Uh, uh, this girl, actually, this lady from Reader's Digest who decided to eat ramen noodles only for five straight days. And at, at the start, she was pretty optimistic about the plan, right? She rotated between several brands of noodles and several flavors. And she even tried to vary her preparations. She added a little kimchi, some veggies. Sometimes she added tofu or mushrooms. But here's what she says about her five days. Five days lang ni, ha? of eating ramen noodles. She said, one thing I noticed was that the effects were not just physical. I got incredibly moody and would snap at things that I would normally hold my tongue at. I wonder what happened to her. Uh, the smallest things would annoy me and I felt myself irritable and cranky during the day. Murag feeling na katulagi. Lugaw na sad. It wasn't exactly what I would deem as enjoyable or fun-filled week. I think it's safe to say that I'm going to be staying away from the ramen for the time being. So imagine, noodles, lunch, breakfast, dinner. So put yourself in the position 
of the Israelites, and we kind of understand what they went through. Now, you would think that being in the desert, you know, there, was, there wouldn't be much things that would grow there. But I want to tell you this. The land between is fertile ground for complaint. <laughs> it's a place where you will find a complaining heart in abundance. And again, in order to find ourselves with the characters, those of you who have experienced being in the land between, you know what a complaining heart is, right? We are whining. We are saying, God, why am I going through this? Lord, why me? And, and you know, I'm sick of this. I, I'm tired of this. You know, I, I'm, I'm tired of, of of getting up every week or I'm, I'm tired of looking at the bills at the end of the month and, and trying to make ends meet. I'm sick of, of sending all the resumes and, and not even landing a first interview. I'm tired of going to the doctor again and again and again with this sickness of mine and I don't know when it's going to end. I'm sick of this, right? And we just need to acknowledge that, that when we're in the land between, Complaint is a normal and natural reaction. And a lot of us, I am sure, most if not all of us, have experienced that. We don't realize it, but suddenly, we are already complaining. Now, let me ask you this question. How serious is that? Is it wrong to complain about the food? Is it wrong to complain about something that's happened to us? Well, let me tell you this. For the situation of the Israelites, it was very serious. Here's what God, through Moses, here's what God tells the Israelites through Moses in Numbers 11. Just jump down to verse 20. He says, Because... You have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? In the complaining and in their whining about the manna and saying, Oh, we remember the leeks. We remember the cucumbers. We remember the garlic. Now all we've got is this manna every day. There was something in their spirits that was going like this. We were better off in Egypt. We were better off as slaves. We were better off without God. And that's something that you and I need to be very careful with when we begin to complain. Because that complaining actually tells us that we are complaining not only about our situations, but also about God. Now, the Israelites were in, in, have been in the wilderness for two years. They have experienced the miracle of the Red Sea. And God had, had brought them into the place, and they, uh, in, into this Sinai desert, and He has given them the Ten Commandments. He had institute, he, it's instituted worship with them. And every day, they would see the miracle of, of the cloud and the pillar of fire. And they saw God's working in their midst day after day when they picked up the manna. And yet, their hearts were complaining. We were better off as slaves. We, we were better off in Egypt. We are better off without God. And so what Moses is telling them is this. Their complaining heart is actually rooted in the rejection of God. You have rejected God. Now, let me ask you something. Why do you think was the land between? Why was the wilderness experience important for the Israelites? Now, one of the things we must remember is this. The desert was not intended to be the final destination for the Israelites, but rather it was a necessary space where God was beginning to form the people into His people to establish their connection with Him. And God, as He was teaching them, 
as he was putting them in this space, God was really teaching them to trust him. This is supposed to be the journey of trust for the Israelites. Now, here's the deal. When we read, as we have read in Numbers chapter 11 about the grumblings of the, of the people of Israel, actually, this was not the first time. Okay? Now, earlier, when you remember the story about the Red Sea, here's what happens. When, when they found themselves trapped, Exodus 14, 11 to 12, this is what they said. They, say, they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Did not we, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So it's like when they were getting attacked, when they, be, when they were being trapped by the Egyptian army, and God was whispering to them, Hey, will you trust me? And they were saying, No, we won't. You know, after that incident, as they traveled through the desert, what happened was, they did not have water, okay? Finally, they found water, and the water was undrinkable. And again, what happened? Exodus 15, 24 says, So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? And so God is, again, telling them in this way, Look, you ran out of water. You have run out of water, but don't worry. Will you trust me? I'll take care of you. And they were saying, No, we won't. And again, they travel a bit farther, and they're out of food. And the first time that God first provided them manna, and, and then look at what they say. Exodus 16, verse 3. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. If you think about it, they were slaves, huh? But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So there was this food crisis, and, and God provides them manna. And what did they say? We were better off in Egypt. And God was telling them, hey, I have provided you food. Will you trust me? And the complaining heart was really saying, no, we won't. We reject you. Again, another time, they had another water shortage. Exodus 17 verse 3. Here's what it says. But the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? You get the picture, right? Round after round after round, God was basically telling them, you know, when you get attacked, when, when you are put in a situation that you do not like, Will you trust me? God was telling them, when you run out of water, when you don't have food to eat, will you trust me? When, when the things that you need seem to be running out, will you trust me? And again and again and again, the Israelites were saying to God in their complaining, no, we won't. Now let's pause for a moment here. What if the very situation that you find yourself in, that situation that you hate the most, the situation that you do not like, what if it's the very space that is intended for your transformation? What if the space that you detest the most has the possibility of producing the fruit that you need the most? Now, I'm telling you this. If you allow it, the land between is the space where we learn to pray. The land between is the, the, the place where we come to the end of ourselves and we say, God, you got to help me. I need you here. I want to know you more, Lord. Show me your ways. The land between is, is where you go, God. I, I'm out of my resources. I, I'm at the end of my ropes. God, I need your joy. I need your peace. I need you really badly. The land between is fertile ground 
for transformational growth, for trust to grow. The very space that we most deeply resent might actually be intended to produce the very fruit that we need. And, and some of us know that. When we have experienced being put in the space that we did not like, when we, God, has put us in the land between, God used that for transformation. But for others, we know that we haven't grown much because we're still complaining. Amen? Now, what are we talking about here? If there's one thing I want you to remember in this message is this. We're talking about choices. We're talking about choices of the heart. You know, we have this expression that says, time heals all wounds, right? But the fact is this. It's not true. It's not always true. Because I, have, I, I know people, you know, that, that heal over time. But I also know people who get ugly, who get bitter, who get, who get resentful over time. The land between is fertile ground for your trust to grow, but it's also the place where your faith can go to die. Remember that. It is fertile place for us to grow in our relationship with our God, in our trust in God, but it's also the place where faith goes to die. And here's the deal. You don't always choose what happens to you. We know that, right? You don't always choose to get, uh, to get who your boss is or what he does. You don't always get to choose what happens to your body to get sick or not. We, we don't always get to choose. I mean, it's not our choice that the national economy might go up or down. Or it's not our choice that there would be a slump in the market. You don't always get to choose what happens to you. Amen? But we all know that we get to choose how we respond to what happens to us. There are choices of the heart when we are in the land between. The choice is whether we are going to complain and reject God or we are going to trust in His faithfulness and in His goodness. Now, since we've been talking a lot about food, actually I, I, I had, I, I, I was supposed to have some object lesson but I left it in the house. But let me ask you a question. When it's snack time, what kind of snacks do you like? Huh? Okay, what kind of snacks do you like? I, I think for some people, they like you know, the junk food type of snacks. You know, the corn chips, potato chips, fish crackers. So, when snacks time, na, that's the one that they grab right away, right? For some of you, you go for the biscuits. A little bit more healthy, a little bit more, you know, a little sweet gamay. For the health conscious, what do you get? Huh? Fruits or crackers, right? Uh, others, I know this is what they do. When it's snack time, they always ask for pan in it, right? Hot bread. In it na pan. That's what I want. And these are choices, right? These are choices. And, and I would like to submit to you that when we pass through a season of difficulty in life, there are also choices that we make. But here's the thing. There's a possibility that we've been making the same choice for so long that it doesn't feel like a choice anymore. We, we, we've been saying, you know, chips always, chips lang, chips, chips, or, or pan in it, pan in it, pan in it. That's always our choice. And, and, and you know, when snack time comes, what do you want? Pan in it. When snack time comes, crackers. Fruits, you know, it's, there's this, because we've done the choice over and over and over again for a thousand times, that it's always the same choice that we make. And the question I would like to ask ourselves this morning is this, where does our heart go? What choices do we make when we are in the land between? 
Now, for some people, here's what they say. You know what? When things go bad, when, when things go the way I don't want them to go, my complaining heart manifests itself in anger. You know, I, I throw stuff around. I'm, I'm hard to, get, to be with. I get angry. I snap at people. And you say, you know, I get angry, but actually you chose to be angry. And, and you say, it doesn't feel like I chose anger. It just happens, right? But here's the thing. Like the Israelites, we've been choosing the same response again and again and again that it doesn't seem like a choice anymore. They've been grumbling and grumbling and complaining and complaining because they, would always, they were always rejecting and rejecting and rejecting God. And sometimes that's what happens to us. We, we, we get angry and we get angry and we get angry. It's the way we express our complaint to God. Sometimes our hearts complain and we just shut off from everybody else. Asa naman to siya? What happened to him? Or sometimes in our anger, we, we get, we, it, it comes out in, in jealousy or envy. We, we, we say, you know, why them and not us when we see somebody who's, who's uh, being promoted? Or we, we, we think, why me? Why am I going through this? Why not them? Right? How come... And we begin to compare ourselves and we begin to be envious and we begin to live a life wishing that we were somebody else other than ourselves. In the land between, our hearts blame others except ourselves. And that's the way we release our hearts, our complaining hearts. And we, if we are not careful, when we choose the same response again and again and again, we fall into the same sin that the Israelites made. Instead of learning to trust in God, in the space between, our faith dies in the wilderness. We need to be very careful. Where does your heart go when you're disappointed? Where does your heart go when you're in the land between? When you face deeply discouraging days or seasons in life, there are choices of the heart. And I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself as well. And sometimes you say, you know, I don't have a choice. But when you say that, it's like saying, you know what? Basically, my response is out of my control. And my friends, we know that's not true, right? You don't always get to choose what happens to you. But you always get to choose how you will respond in your pain, in your situation, when you are in the land between. It's what we do in the land between that spells the difference between growth and decline. Let me end with a... A story that I read and heard from Pastor Jeff Manion. Um, he wrote this book, The Land Between. And he was talking about the time when he was preaching from James chapter 1. We know James chapter 1, verse 2 says, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And, and as he was teaching this, he was telling the congregation that, you know what, James is really telling us that when we experience challenging and difficult times, we need to choose joy. We, we need to make a choice to, to be joyful because as the, the, the verse actually reads uh, further, choosing joy is a test of our faith that leads to maturity. It tests our trust in God. Now, it's a Christian response that is anchored in the belief that, that God is good, that God is wise, that God is in control, that somehow He will do good in your situation and redeem your situation. So he says, choose joy, choose joy. Now, he didn't know that as he was preaching on that day, there was a visitor from out of state. Her name was Julie, and her husband's name was Chris. And they had a daughter. Their first daughter came after a very difficult process of surgery and uh, in vitro fertilization. And after their first daughter, they had three miscarriages. I mean, I, I mean the, 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 the wife had three miscarriages as they attempted to have, have another child. And the reason why they were in that church on that day was because Julie... 
her sister, the sister of Julie, was pregnant. And that she was going to be offering her half-hearted support uh, in a series of baby showers. So she was there to support her sister who was pregnant, but she herself went through three miscarriages at that time. And somehow as she was listening to the message, as she was listening to, um, to the talk about James chapter 1, it struck her. And Julie decided to allow her painful situation to result in a, a more, uh, to, to, to begin to trust in God more. Now that, that decision, that was a breakthrough for her. But that decision did not change her situation. Because after that, she experienced two more miscarriages. And during those months, but during those months, you know, she shared it to Pastor Jeff. During those months, she began to lean on to God. Her, her faith and her trust in God grew. A few years later, um, during one of the services, uh, Julie walks up to Pastor Manion with a new baby girl. Her second daughter, she called the baby Ellie Joy. They had waited for this for a long time. And here's what Pastor Manion says. I like what he says. He says, now the miracle of Julie and Chris's situation is not that God gave them a second baby daughter. That's wonderful and that's a miracle too. But the miracle to me is that God rescued her heart in the middle of a mess. That's the miracle. The miracle to me is that Julie and Chris chose trust and they chose joy in what anybody's evaluation would be just a really difficult series of situations and that God, and that God rescued her heart and gave her trust and it grew. So here's the question. What if the space that you most detest, the place where you don't want to be, is supposed to produce the crop that you most need. What if the season of pain, season of confusion, what if you allow it, if God desires for you to have transforming faith to grow? There are choices of the heart. Amen? In the land between, you do not have to invite complaint to show up. We all know that. It just arrives like an uninvited guest. And even when you seek to remove it, even when you seek to not complain, it finds its way and sneaks back at us. And suddenly we, we find ourselves complaining again. And, and complaint really does not want to be evicted. But here's the thing. We can remove or lessen a complaining heart by inviting another guest. And that guest is trust. You know, when trust has taken residence in your soul, when again and again and again you make a decision to trust in God, you will find that complaint will have a hard time coming in. You know why? Because trust will evict complaint. They are incompatible roommates. You cannot both trust and complain at the same time. Already, but not yet. The land between is fertile ground for us to be changed and to be transformed. It's also the place where faith goes to die. And we choose. Day after day, we choose. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you, O oh God, because you have made a way for us to be able to have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that every day your mercies are new and that your grace is always sufficient for us. Not only for our salvation, but also for us to be able to live a life of victory. And yes, Lord, we know we can fail 
in so many different ways. But you have said in your word that when we come before you and ask for forgiveness, you will always be faithful to forgive us. And that we can always come to you. And in the land between, we know, O oh God, that you have promised us that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And we pray, O oh God, that as we remember this message today, that we will cultivate trust. We will cultivate our faith and believe in you day after day after day to make that choice to trust in you because you are a faithful God, you are a good God, and you're a wonderful God. This is our prayer today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all rise up for our final song.
Lord God, we worship you. Thank you, O Lord. Thank you, O God, for your presence in our midst. We worship you, O Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God besides you. You are powerful and mighty. You are wonderful and good. You are worthy of our worship. Lord, we come before you. We bow our knees and our hearts before you. There is none like you, O God. There is none like you. We worship you, Lord. We bless your name. We hallow your name. We want to honor you, O God. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for being so faithful to us, Lord.